Hello. What's going on, Mike? Good. How you doing, man? Good. Good to uh, chat with you. And, dude, I was like two steps behind you just a, a week or so ago at the the uh, Nam Schechter party at Stages. Oh, you were there? Yeah. And I saw you taking a picture with uh, Clinton. And I was like, okay, I'm going to go up to him and say what's up next. And then I turned around and you were leaving. And I was like, ah, I'll catch him at another time. But glad we found some time to chat about this uh, this new album, man. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me on the show. Of course, of course. I was kind of blown away. I thought initially it was going to be like some death metal project or something with some other singer, but I listened to it and it was complete the opposite with you singing and playing all the instruments I imagine and kind of wanted to learn when this all got started. Was this a, a sitting around bored during the pandemic and then you started writing this music or did it start before then or take me back to, to making this one? The idea came around in 2018, I think it was. So it was before the pandemic. Okay. And luckily the pandemic did give me some extra free time to work on it and finally finish things up because it took a very long time. I can imagine. I can imagine. And you play every instrument on it? No, I did everything but the drums. Those were played by my old bandmate, uh, Devil Driver, Austin Diamon. Oh, who yeah. Who is probably my all time favorite drummer on earth. And he's really? one of my best friends. He lives near me. And uh, obviously, the right guy to uh, bring in on the project. Well, I love, like I said, vocally, not just one voice, but you give a couple different flavors. And it's weird. It's almost like a little bit of like, Gojira meets Tool meets Nine Inch Nails for me. Was that kind of where your headspace was at? Or was there any thought going into it? Or just it just came out of you? It just came out that way. I did not know which direction I wanted to go for. And I just, as I was going through the songs, whatever voice I came up with for one song necessarily wasn't working for the other song. So I had to change things up a bit. It was, there was a lot of experimenting going on in on this record which now that i'm working on the second record already oh wow it, it's a lot more exciting for me because i've kind of found where i work and where i don't work and the next record's going to be a lot easier <laughs> for me than the first one was i'm glad i got the first one out of the way now yeah i mean that's like anything the more you do it the better you get at it and, and especially finding your voice i imagine yeah and i was a little bit out of my comfort zone in the beginning but uh because i didn't i I didn't have a good idea of exactly what I was going to do. You know, was it going to be genre specific? Was it going to be like this huge melting pot of different ideas, which is kind of where things ended up going in the long run. But uh, in the long run, it was, I think it was a good thing to do because there's a little something for everybody on the record at this point. Yeah, it feels very, like, familiar without sounding exactly like anybody. Like, it, it sounds, and it's a full album. It takes you on a journey, which I love, too, which I think uh, bands are getting away from and all these EPs and a singles market. But, man, I put on that album and let it roll, and, and it takes me on the roller coaster of emotions, which is what an album's supposed to do. I think so. We, I grew up in that era where that's yeah. the way things were done, and... Not saying I would never release a couple singles. I am planning on releasing a couple more singles in uh, spring of this year at some point, and which will be on the next Verona record, which I'm already obviously working on. But uh, I will always be releasing a bulk of songs at some point. There might be a few singles in there, but sure. um, and maybe an EP, but probably just a few singles here and there leading up to a full album release is the way I'd like to do things. Beautiful, man. Now, the big question, too, are we going to get a live show? Are you going to do this thing live? Yes. That is my main priority right now. So I've got some members lined up. I've been rehearsing with a uh, uh, my lead guitar player a lot lately. And six months before the end of 2024, there will be a Verón on Venus live show, probably in the L.A. area somewhere. Awesome, man. Can't wait to see. Can you say who the lineup is or you no one say yet or not yet? Uh, things aren't 100 percent solidified and I want to get these guys in a room with me. And uh, I did post a little blurb about my guitar player, even though I kept his identity a secret a couple days ago. And uh, 
he's a hundred percent. He's someone I've known for a very long time. He's a fantastic guitar player. And um, I just like his vibe. And uh, it's exciting. I'm looking forward to it. Getting used to singing and playing guitar at the same time. Yes. But whether I'm going to be playing guitar the whole set or not is a little bit left to be seen. I'm not sure. Mm. I might not. I actually might not play guitar at all. I haven't decided yet. Oh, wow. Interesting. Interesting. Well, I can't wait for the live show. And obviously, you got to talk a little bit about the the day job, so to speak, and uh, give you congratulations. It's 20 years now in Devil Drivers. Des gotten you a, a Rolex or anything yet or? Not yet. Maybe he hasn't. Hasn't told me yet. It, 20 years doesn't hit until April. Ah, OK. So he's still plotting it out, probably. But we're weeks away from. <laughs> from that that 20th anniversary and it was great to see you guys back in the new album and on the double trouble live with the cradle of filth run got to see you at the observatory and in riverside and look like you guys are having a blast out there with them we are i really like the new guys in the band it's awesome to have uh john miller back in the band we picked up right where we left off you know we didn't he moved to the other side of the country you know, over a decade ago, and he lives in Maine now, so we don't really get to hang out as much as we want to, but we always kept in touch. And him coming back on the tour bus and the writing sessions for the Devil Driver's next record, which we're in the writing process for right now, oh. has, you know, I kind of feel like I'm in my early 20s again. <laughs> he and I have known each other since I was 18, and I think he was 19 at the time, and we were in a band before Devil Driver, and um, we've spent a lot of time together. Old roommates, right? Very briefly. I The last place, the last house I lived in in Santa Barbara had an extra room. So when there were two tours that they did without me, and uh, in between those two tours, I would let Jeff Kendrick and John Miller stay in the extra room in my house. My other roommates, I don't think, were terribly thrilled about that, but... <laughs> They needed a place to live. You know, the band was new and just getting their feet wet. And so I, I took pity on them. And, and that's actually the reason why I'm in the band is because right. I was I just happened to be in the right place at the right time when Jeff came home and told me the bad news that uh, their original guitar player wasn't going to be going to Europe with him. I was just so I was there. I'll go. <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> like, I'll quit my band. I'll quit my job. I'll drop out of school. Whatever needs to be done. Get me on that plane to Europe. You know, because we're opening up for In Flames, and which is one of my all time favorite bands. And it was just like, there is no way I'm not going on this tour. I'm going to figure it out. And I did. And it was only supposed to be for two, three weeks, whatever the tour was. It was a short tour. And but by the time I came home, they gave me, they offered me the job. So I was like, done. I'm in. Sweet. And by the way, what's up with Jeff Kendrick these days? You still keep in touch with him? Yeah, I keep in touch with all the old guys. He's uh, in Santa Monica doing his real estate thing. And I think it's been he's been successful with it. And uh, I think he's very content with where his life is. You know, he's not in the music industry anymore and he's doing well. Killer. And, you know, running out the new lineup, too, got talking about Axe Slingers. Love that uh, Alex Lee is now in the band. <laughs> Loved what he did in Bonded by Blood with that band. And was the easy fit. Were, were you the guy that bring him in or did he like audition or? No, I brought him in. I We had two people audition. And uh, when I got his tape back, I was probably 10 seconds in. And I was like, yeah, this is going to be the guy. We had toured together in the past with his old band, Holy Grail. Okay. And I liked his attitude. Um, and he's a much better lead player than I am. So there's just a lot for me to learn from him as well. And he's just a fun guy to be around, you know, and... You know, you're never 100 percent sure if the guy is going to be the guy until you actually get him out on tour. Sure. And spend some time with him. So there was always, well, you know, if I think we hired him probably two years before we did the first tour. With him oh, wow. Because of the pandemic, you know, and it was right in the middle of things. And it's like, well, we need a guitar player, but I'm not exactly sure when we're going to be going on tour again. So, um. Yeah, he was around for a while until we actually got him in out on a tour bus. So, but the first tour went great. Our new drummer Davi, just as an amazing guy, and I'm really, really happy with the lineup that we have right now. 
So was he able to be part of dealing with demons part two, or was that long done before he had gotten into the band, Alex? That was long done before these guys came into the fold, even Miller. A lot of people think that dealing with demons volume two was the current lineup. And no, that was, that was Austin, Neil, me and Des, and with our producer, Steve Evitz doing, we did, we did all those songs for both volumes all at once, which was brutal. I don't ever <laughs> want to do a double record ever again. Um, I think we broke Steve Evitz because when he got to the mixing phase, he was just like, okay, I've got 10 songs done and I'm only halfway done. Jeez. And uh, it was, it was, don't get me wrong. It was probably the most fun record I've ever done, but um, I can cross that off my list and <laughs> I can just stick to one record at a time from here on out. I, I do have to call you out and give, give some grief. And I guess it's got to go on your shoulders, man. But the, the tune, if blood is life, mm -hmm. you know where I'm going with it? About two minutes and 20 seconds into that tune. Yeah, I think I know where you're going with that. <laughs> I did not. I didn't write that part. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, man, somebody had been listening to way too much Pantera lately. No one even point. You know who pointed it out to me is uh, John Miller when he rejoined the band. <laughs> Get it back on. Oh, shit. Yeah. How did none of us pick up on that? Whoops. <laughs> I was like, the moment I heard it, I was like, wow, they just went into revolution. It's my name. Yeah. Yeah, we did. Um. <laughs> I've had a couple little other O's like that, but luckily I've caught them before they actually, you know, were made permanent. <laughs> Every now and then one one will get by. You know, I'm curious, man, with, with 20 years, uh, is there a definitive Devil Driver song for you or one that you feel like you really put your stamp that's your baby in the catalog? I always kind of go back to I've Been Sober off Pray for Villains, mainly because the uh, it has a lot to do with the solo at the end and I, I would definitely put that on one of one of my lists of my crowning achievements like i still don't think i've beaten that solo <laughs> yet like it just it tells this awesome story it kind of goes on forever you know um i'm not gonna lie freebird was kind of on my mind when I, I wrote the end of that and yeah i just I always go back to that song and we don't really play it live anymore, but I always get fans that come up to me after shows like, oh, man, why didn't you play? I've been sober. Not playing a lot from that album. Anything off of Pray for Villains. Uh, it hasn't been that long since we played Pure Sincerity. OK, Um, that was in the mix for a long time. And God, off the top of my head, it's even hard for me to kind of visualize what songs are on each I record because it's this. I remember the time when we used to have a hard time, you know, we would play pretty much every song off every record up until we got to pray for villains. Like every, every album from the self titled to fury to last kind words. I think we've played every song on those record on each of those records, except for two. There's two songs in each of those records. We've never played live. Wow. And then after pray for villains, it just became, well, there's four songs and then there's six songs and so on and so forth. And you just get to the point where, you're like, what do we do? <laughs> like, we can start doing some obscure ones and the fans can get mad at us or we can play what everybody knows. But then the hardcore fans come up to us and be like, well, man, why don't you play some more deep cuts? And you're right. just right. finding that balancing act is not always the easiest thing to do when you get to this point where you have 10 records. Right, right. And you got the ones you know you have to play the clouds over California and everything like. Yeah. End of the line. Meet the wretched. Um, uh hold back the day even though i don't think we played that on the last run i can't even remember i could care less obviously i don't think we've ever not played i could care less since the beginning of the band dude speaking of records interesting to see on on your resume that uh you did the wednesday 13 album necro yeah oh that was fun i had so much fun doing that record i i loved working with wednesday 13 and all the other guys and um it was cool to be able to do that record and then immediately go out on tour with them in support of that record when we were opening up for Static X. And Wednesday is... He's like this hidden secret that I was just not made aware of. Like, I knew of him through Murder Dolls, but I had never taken the time to really jump into Wednesday 13's solo project. And... Which is weird because he's got this gothy industrial kind of vibe going on, which is right up my, my my favorite genre of music. 
<laughs> and um, as far as a front man, he is just one of the best. Like, even when we were on that tour, I'd be talking to crew members and he, <laughs> people come up to me like, dude, you guys are great. Like, I love your band. But I like watching Wednesday 13 the best. Yeah, uh, they're just he is an amazing front man. If you anyone listening, go listen to some of his newest records. You will not be disappointed. You're just going to be like, why have I not taken the time to check out this band? They're fantastic. How awesome was it for you to get to work on that album and get to record legends like Alice Cooper and, and Alexi? Or or did they all <laughs> just send those in or or tell me? They sent those in. Calico Cooper came over um, to do her parts, but obviously like Christina from Lacuna Coil. Right. I think Marco just recorded the, the bassist. Marco recorded her for those parts at his home studio. Uh, Alice sent me his stuff. Um, and also Alexi just uh, recorded his stuff in Finland and sent it to me and I just mixed it in. So uh, those people never made their way in actually into my studio, but um yeah, I was, you know, jumping back, going back in time, being like, wow, <laughs> I'm mixing in Alice Cooper as the intro for this record. Like, never thought that day would come. Because I was, even when I was a little kid, I was a big Alice Cooper fan. His album, Trash. Oh, yeah, of course. Poison and all that. Yeah, definitely has a place ingrained in my childhood. <laughs> and now it's on your credits. You get to say, oh, yeah, I worked with Alice Cooper. Yeah, it's. Yep. I, was, I was very happy about that. And Calico, she's a lot of fun, man. She's she's a lot of fun to work with. I was happy to uh, to work with her. Any any old stories about Alexi since he's passed? I always like to shine the light on those who have gone. You know, the only times that I got to hang out with Alexi were at festivals and a couple times at Nam. Mm. Uh, we never did a full blown Children of Bodom tour with Devil Driver, so definitely a few times at festivals. And I do remember hanging out and hanging out with him at Nam. He seemed like a fantastic guy, but um, I didn't know him very well, unfortunately. I can't say I was I was close with him. Mike, appreciate all the time. Last couple of things I wanted to hit you with, a couple little music debates, because ultimately what you do, what I do, we're all just music fans in the end, right? And uh, you had mentioned it earlier, and one of the things I love about the new album is that industrial flavor you bring to it. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned your love for industrial. No way to not talk about industrial without talking about the GOAT, Trent Reznor nine inch nails mm -hmm. oh, my nine inch nails debate is real simple it's album one versus album two pretty hate machine versus the downward spiral if you had to pick one out of those two which one would be your numero uno downward spiral tell me why tell me why it's darker it's i kind of feel like trent was just getting his feet wet with pretty hate machine and i love pretty hate machine i think that's a fantastic record but the broken EP, of course, leading into you know, and let, let's face it, the broken EP and downward spiral are kind of the same animal. You know, you could take those songs and mix match them, and they would they they would fit. Sure, but, but there's just something about the downward spiral. It's darker. It's meaner. Um, it's it's like Trent found his footing, and it's to me an absolute masterpiece. I actually had a conversation with someone that I will. Not, I'm not, I'm not going to say who his name is, but we were having a debate probably 10 years ago about whether that album has quote unquote good production or not. And I think it does. Oh my God. He, he said it did not, you know, and I'm like, That's... yeah, it, it doesn't sound like the black album as far as production wise, but the way it's produced is the way it should be produced. You know, it's a little rough around the edges. It's dirty. It's gritty. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of things that he recorded that are oversaturated. And personally, it's kind of like an old school ministry record to me, like the um, the mind is a terrible thing to tate or Psalm 69. Okay. Like they're not recorded like the Black Album or something very modern. But I don't think I'd want to hear them like that. Oh, the, the production fits. Right. So, yeah, 100 percent downward spiral. Love Pretty Hate Machine. But I. uh I love everything about that downward spiral record. I think it's fantastic. Me too, man. I, I agree that way more like soundscapes and different vibes and, and moods and brutally heavy guitar in the mid nineties when guitar wasn't cool. You know, some of those songs are brutally heavy on that album. Yeah. He did his own thing with guitar tracks too. Like for instance, I've been, I've done 
searches on how to not that I want to, I'm just curious how he got the guitar tone on Wish. And yeah. it's I don't think how hard I tried and how many days I tried to mess with everything that I have in here. I don't think I'd be able to <laughs> replicate that. Not that I would want to, I want to do my own thing, but it's how he got that in the early nineties blows my mind. It's funny. I asked Des that same question, album one versus two. He leaned a uh, pretty hate machine. He's like, cause you could just hear it was a dude pissed off in his basement and he wanted out. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's not a bad way to look at it. <laughs> Definitely not a bad way to look at things. I had a feeling though, you were going to go album two, which is my preference out of the two. I, li I listen to that record more than I do pretty hate machine. Yeah, Pretty Hate Machine's a little bit more certain tracks where Downward Spiral or just press play and let it go. But my two favorite songs are probably are actually not on Downward Spiral, being Sin and Wish. Yeah. But, but overall, I'd still pick the Downward Spiral. Sin is my favorite, too, off of Pretty Hate Machine. Without yeah, it's such a good song. And that, I probably more suck for... Uh, for the EP, just because my my band used to cover that too, and so oh yeah, it's nice special place for my heart, dude. Appreciate all the time. One more music debate for you, man. Sure, We're old school radio station. We do a feature called Mandatory Metallic every night, which you're going to be a part of at 10 p.m. And so Metall Metallica debates kind of the same way, debating the greatest Metallica album coming down to two versus three, Ride the Lightning versus Master of Puppets. If you had to pick out of those two. The master of puppets justice is my favorite record but master is is a very very close tie i like the progressive writing i mean i take it back <laughs> uh master of puppets definitely has its progressive moments in it but there's something about the songs on justice even though you can't really hear the bass everyone <laughs> loves to talk about but when i was a kid i had a tendency to gravitate toward that record the most and i still do to this day that was probably your entry point, Justice, right? And then work backwards? No, my entry point was Enter Sandman. Ah. I I had never heard of Metallica until I saw him pl play Enter Sandman on the Video Music Awards, MTV Video Music Awards. Right. And after that, I was hooked. And I went from there, I, you know, I went back in time. I think I got, I got the Black Album, then I got Justice, and then I skipped Master of Puppets, got Ride the Lightning, and then I got Kill Em All, and then I got Master of Puppets very last. Why? It, it was like the universe was telling me, just save the best for last. Just, just, <laughs> just, we'll just wait, get it all, and then we're going to give you Master of Puppets, and it's going to blow your mind, and that's exactly what happened. Yeah, I mean, I think that album is flawless, takes you on a journey, all kind of different sounds, tempos, heavy, melodic, instrumental, whatever you want. It's It's all packed in there. Yeah, they got a little bit of everything on that record. It's fantastic. Do you have a favorite Metallica tune we could play for you on Mandatory Metallica? Harvester of Sorrow. Oh, nice. Nice. Thank you so much. Thanks. Can't wait for the live show as well. And anything else pops up, you guys know how to get a hold of me. Sounds good, man. Thanks, dude. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.